Welcome to Strategy Talk, where the editors of Strategy Page discuss current events with a splash of history. I'm Dan Masterson, host of Strategy Talk. With me today is the editor of Strategy Page, well-known military author and game designer, Jim Dunnigan. Also joining us is the associate editor of Strategy Page, of Strategy Page columnist and author, Austin Bay. Welcome, Austin and Jim. Thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about Yemen today, uh, especially the Iranian involvement there, Jim. Uh, the Iranian propaganda machine has done a very good job of uh, casting the uh, rebels in a good light and uh, making the uh, Saudi-backed uh, Yemeni forces uh, the evil guys. How, how have they been able to do that? Well, it isn't just the Iranian. It's the Iranian, Russian, Chinese, uh, and any other allies they can scrape up. You know, their their usual, uh, how should I put it, the axis of evil. That includes, uh, well, Venezuela for a while, <laughs> North Korea, uh, Cuba. Uh, what a motley group of, uh, group of uh, propagandists. But they have been successful because the Venezuelans and the, uh, the uh, uh, Iranians in particular have been very astute about uh, you know picking out the uh, the how should I put the vulnerabilities in Western media, which they realize, uh, as do the Chinese, uh, has a great deal of influence in the UN, being that it's headquartered in New York City, but for other reasons as well. The majority of the donations that support the UN come from Western countries, which are very sensitive to uh, all sorts of things that uh, don't bother. Uh, you know, the countries of Arabia. I mean, for example, the, the warfare, now we've been covering, we've been covering Yemen since the beginning. I mean, it was a disaster uh, even before the, the current civil war. Um, and that's the problem with the, uh, the way the, uh, the Iranian uh, 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 media uh, takes the lead in putting out stories. You know, obviously they have people on the ground who can get pictures and, uh, and details that no one else can, because most of the uh, the atrocities they're reporting are taking place in rebel territory. Uh, they control the message, as it were. Uh, the pictures are provided by their people, uh, and uh, the uh, the pictures do not feature the uh, stationing of uh, you know rebel troops and equipment, ammunition, what have you. In residential neighborhoods, uh, the Saudis, you know, the, the, the people, countries in the Middle East do not have the same rules of engagement as the West, and that tends to be overlooked a lot. Uh, but you saw it in Syria, where the Russians, while well, the Russians have the same uh, rules of engagement as most Middle Eastern countries, and that's their secret. But nobody reports it that way. See, look, these people don't fight the way we fight. They are, well, blah, 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 call them whatever nasty name you want to, but they do it differently. They don't pay attention to uh, trying to protect your, uh, your troops or your assets uh, with civilians. Uh, now, this is no secret because uh, it basically did become a newsworthy issue back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, when uh, Iraq was under you know, uh, increased, uh, how should I put it, uh, air interdiction. Uh, you know, there was an embargo on all sorts of stuff. Of course, it later turned out that the UN was taking bribes uh, to allow all sorts of uh, stuff to go in and out anyway. But that's another story. The um, uh, the uh, the media has no memory. I mean, that's not, that's you know, that, that's that's not cynical. That's just an observation. Uh, that's why they, they people don't, as we put it. Uh, report the news uh, news as history because history is memory news is not um, so everything is brand new uh, you know like another uh, aircraft crash um, uh, and uh, and it plays you know it gets traction uh, and that's what the news is all about I mean as has been said for decades if it bleeds it leads um, and even though everybody bemoans, that, oh, that's terrible, we should concentrate on, you know, serious stuff. The fact of the matter is that if it's something like that, it gets people's attention. Like when there's a, a crash or a fire, people will cluster around looking. You know, oh, isn't this terrible? Let me see. Let me get closer. Um, 
fascist human nature and the media takes advantage of it. And any propagandist for their, you know, their pay uh, will take advantage of it as, as well. Uh, this is what's going on, for example, in Venezuela right now. Uh, they, they, they take advantage of the fact that the U.S. media won't mention the word socialism, which is the main, main cause of all the, the grief in uh, in uh, Venezuela, because socialism, if you look at the examples of it around the world, it's primarily failed uh, because it's corrupt and inefficient. Um, but that never gets mentioned. It gets mentioned in Europe. I mean, if you want to see a better picture of what's going on in uh, Venezuela, uh, go look at the European media, which tends to be less invested in ideology uh, than a lot of the American media. Uh, but they also don't, uh, uh, American media, uh, for example, do not like to pay attention to the Cuban connection. Now, we've been covering that for, for over a decade. Cubans have been in there, even though they're not in there as much because they've been cut off. No more free oil. Uh, <clears throat> they had to send all the doctors home. But what they didn't send home were the security consultants. In other words, the secret police from Cuba, who have a lot of experience in taking care of, uh, how should I put it, uh, ungrateful citizens. Um, and so that's why when they, uh, when you've now got a real, uh, how should I put it, a uh, bit of pressure on the Maduro government with the, uh, the, the Americans, uh, uh, well, most countries in the Americas, getting together and recognizing the guy who technically is the last truly elected, you know, representative of the people, like Guaido, uh, who's the head of the, uh, you know, the, uh, I can, uh, you actually put it, the uh, parliamentary. National you know, Assembly. National. Well, the last National Assembly that was that was elected through uh, reasonably fair elections. Um, he was recognized as the, you know, the, the only legitimate head of the country, and all the bank accounts have been switched to him. Now that's big news because that's hitting Maduro where it hurts. He's got no money. He's got now he's got a, a embargo where we are the primary uh, source of his uh, his uh, sour crude, which requires special chemicals and refineries to uh, to uh, use. And we're the primary customer because we have the refineries and we sell them the special chemicals, you know, to dilute this stuff so it's you know even refinable. Uh, so he's really cut off now. Uh, even though he, he was doing it himself by having inefficient people, uh, loyal hacks, as it were, uh, run the oil industry in, literally into the ground. The uh, only part of the oil industry that's doing any good now is the 10 or 20 percent of it that the Chinese have taken over. Um, but even the Chinese depend on those old you know, connections, those American refineries and what have you. Uh, but they're at least getting the fields pumping efficiently. Uh, and the Chinese are doing it. Not for Maduro, they're pitching now. They, they, here's propaganda for you. The Chinese are saying, we're doing this for the Venezuelan people. You know, sort of cutting out the bad guys in the middle, uh, which is very astute. The Russians are talking about their investments, their assets in, in Venezuela. So already his, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you would think they're his allies, but they're not really. Uh, they see the painting, uh, you know, the uh, you know the, the writing on the wall, as it were, uh, that Maduro is a total loser. They won't say that, but it's obvious. Um, and the only thing, they, as, the, as the news sites likes to put it, is how long will the security forces hang on? Well, until somebody else buys them off, which is apparently underway now. But see, you don't read about that in the news. But historically, that's what happens. Um, it's what happened in um, in Yemen. Uh, again, it didn't get that reported that much. The uh, the uh, the Iranians uh, were cut off uh, when the uh, when the uh, when the last major port in the in the Red Sea, Hodeida, uh basically got got under embargo. That's where most of the food comes through. But the uh, the, the the Saudis finally uh, bit the bullet, as it were, and said, "Look, most of that food is not going to the people who need it." Because the uh, the rebels control it, and they they've been stockpiling it in their home provinces up by the Saudi border for you know over a year now, and and selling a lot of it off onto the market, and not delivering it to anybody who who's giving them a hard time, which is most of the people in Yemen. Uh, so the use of the uh, the media uh, to control the message and control the uh, international response. 
is, is standard operating practice, and that's why a lot of people ignore the UN. The UN says, oh, this is terrible, something should be done, and everybody goes, oh, well, keep bombing. Uh, it didn't stop the, uh, the, Assyri- the Assyrian government. Uh, it didn't stop the Saudis or the UAE. I mean, European countries make a big deal out of, oh, my God, we're not going to sit, sell weapons to uh, 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 those nasty Saudis anymore. Well, the Saudis will just buy it from somebody else. Heck, they could probably buy it from the Israelis, uh, which would be ironic as, as all get out. But that's the way business is done in the Middle East. Uh, the problem with, with Yemen is it's been an economic mess long before uh, the two, 2015 civil war began. Uh, the, uh, the rebels uh, got some traction early on when they said that we're going to clean up the corruption. But they, again, turned out to be as corrupt as the people they were trying to replace. Uh, you know, and it became common practice for them to be stealing uh, uh, you know, uh, a foreign uh, aid uh, for their own purposes, and uh, then bringing in the Iranians, who they always, uh, you know, swore up and down they had nothing to do with. Uh, uh, they got Hezbollah, you know, uh, technical advisors showing them how to uh, assemble rockets and, and use them. Uh, they, they've been firing over a hundred uh, uh, rockets and uh, large rockets and ballistic missiles into Saudi Arabia. That doesn't get much news. Well, prim- primarily because the Patriot missiles have been knocking the, the rockets down, or at least the ones that were getting close to a residential area. Uh, and uh, so that's not news. But the, the, when they write the history of the, what's going on in Venezuela and uh, in Yemen, uh, you know, the, the media where they'll find the most accurate, you know, uh, real-time account is a place like Strategy Page. Dan, you want me to comment on that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I want to point out several things that Jim said when he went through it uh, with his uh, <clears throat> appropriate damnation of general uh, media coverage of Yemen and then moved into Venezuela as an example. Stalin used to erase pictures of of uh, individuals who had fallen out of favor with his uh, totalitarian dictatorship, communist totalitarian dictatorship, uh, revolutionary socialist totalitarian dictatorship. They just disappear. You'd have the same picture, except that person who is now probably deceased was no longer in the picture. Some of these techniques are not new. Selective reporting, focusing on, as Jim said, you know, they, they, they uh, in Yemen, the Iranians have been very clever at focusing on very, very narrow reports that portray the, the Saudi-led coalition or the West or even the UN in the in the worst of lights. It's surprising to me that the Iranians still have any credibility with some of these groups, but they use their own Internet resources to push them out. Uh, I look at them occasionally. I know Jim does. doesn't show up in, <laughs> in material that we write about, about Yemen because it's, it's outlandish. Uh, agitation propaganda is what it amounts to. Uh, it's an information operation. It's narrative warfare. Again, it's not new. The Middle East, Syria does it. There's so many things that uh, Hamas has done are, are uh, what Jim described as going on in Yemen. You had it for years vis-a-vis ha- Hamas. Also, with some of the radical Arab groups and their uh, protests of, uh, uh, of Israel. Just e- extraordinary accusations that over time, solid reporting says, well, it didn't happen this way, or the pictures were faked, or the camera was only pointed in one direction. Now, that's, that's one of the shames in, in, in uh, the case of, uh, uh, of Yemen, is, is the falsehood around it. Another one is just absolute neglect, because there's so many uh, major media organizations that don't see this as uh, significant, as significant as Syria. I think part of that is is that you don't see the United States and Great Britain, the traditional, you know, <laughs> and Great Britain on the ground in uh, 
in, in Yemen. Uh, therefore, it's not a story for the Washington press corps in the same way. And that's almost like their first audience is. Now, I'm going to try to sell a, a book here, but understand I, I, where I, I got most of the information. On page 119 of my new book, Cocktails from Hell, you've got a timeline capturing what I call critical and illustrative events in Yemen. And basically, after talking about who the Ansar Allah artisans of God are, uh, the Houthis, uh, I start in June of 2004 with a timeline that runs, uh, let's see, runs up to page uh, 131. It's uh, really uh, right at 12, 12 and a half pages of events that get, provide the background for this absolutely complex hell that is occurring, still continues to occur in Yemen, and part of it promoted by selective reporting, false reporting, and neglect. And that was part of when, when Jim's uh, opening analysis, that was a theme running through it. I'm sitting there listening, yeah, 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 okay. So he goes and pats a uh, strategy page on the back, but we, give an, we make an attempt to provide that historical uh, background. Now, it, I've written this in, in numerous numerous columns. You can see this in, in, in uh, several of Jim's analysis, especially since 2009, 2010, when we started uh, uh, covering uh, Yemen as, as one of the uh, specific wars uh, uh, on uh, a strategy page. It's, it's an absolute nest of wars. It's not just one war, and that's there. You'll see headlines, you'll see wire service reports, some either uninformed or deceptive commentaries, and by that I mean op-ed type commentaries, talking about the war in Yemen, and then they focus on uh, Saudi coalition versus the Houthis. Really? Well, that's there, but that in and of itself is at least two, three, perhaps, conflicts, maybe four, but they're missing the rest of the place. Look, I'll give you a, another historical example, <laughs> and, and I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to my point when I talk about the, the nest of wars that is Yemen right now in 2019, and really has been, well, when do you start? 1911. In 1911, the Turks stripped most of their division that was located in what was amount as contemporary uh, Libya, Tripolitania, and Cyrenaica uh, on the Mediterranean coast, modern Libya, and moved it to Yemen to put down a tribal rebellion. They also moved uh, some uh, uh, troops that they had elsewhere in the Middle East, uh, in what's contemporary Iraq, and uh, some other uh, uh, other forces in what amounts to being greater Syria. But they, uh, the, the big move there was stripping them from, uh, from Libya and moved them to Yemen. Why? There was a rebellion going on, uh, and some of the rebellion related to some of the rebels were also brigands, and they were attacking and robbing um, uh, uh, pilgrims moving from Red Sea ports uh, to Mecca and Medina. And uh, the, the Turks controlled uh, the Hejaz at the, at the time where the uh, Islamic holy sites are located. So they had many reasons to send more troops in there to try to calm the region. They had no uh, delusions that they were going to uh, defeat this rebellion. They were going to try to mitigate it and then make a deal. Unfortunately, what happens as soon as they uh, denude their or strip their uh, defenses in, in Libya, Italy attacks. And you have the uh, Turco-Italian War of 1911 to 1912 which was actually the first air war. The uh, Italians used dirigibles and some uh, monoplanes to drop hand grenades and, and mortar bombs on 
some of the uh, Turks and some of their uh, Arab uh, auxiliaries. That set up a vulnerability in the Balkans where the Balkan League attacks the Turks in the First Balkan War, and now we're on our way to World War I. So now I'm given a list of my historical context. Am I blaming Yemen? No. What I'm saying is, is Yemen, for where it's located, given its geography, and its location is important. I mean, it's on the southwestern corner of the Arabian Peninsula, Greater Arabian Peninsula. It's uh, in, you know, just across the Red Sea from uh, North Africa. It's one corner of uh, Yemen, this very southwestern corner. Bab al-Mandab is a narrow strait similar to the Strait of Hormuz, now through which uh, tankers carrying oil move to the Suez Canal to uh, take to uh, uh, Europe. Uh, and there's also plenty of trade moving back uh, uh, through the uh, uh, through the area. There's plus is the port of Aden, which is on the southern side, and at one time it, it was a British protectorate, a, British, a, a big uh, a big port uh, for the uh, Roy, Royal Navy. Uh, and it's, it sits right there, moving under the Indian Ocean, but also the East African littoral. Okay. I've laid out the geography for you, but today, what interests Iran is Yemen's the back door to Saudi Arabia. Oh, historical context there. Uh, you've heard uh, Jim and um, me go on about Iranian versus Arab, Aryan versus Arab Semites going on for at least 3,000 years. That animosity, that uh, racial bias, bigotry is at play uh, in the conflict between contemporary Iran and Saudi Arabia, and some of that's being fought out in Yemen. Now, I don't see that brought up very often uh, in, in what I'll call the popular press, because it's difficult to deal with. Uh, the, the, the racism is supposed to be a Western affectation instead of the, the, the common tr the tribalism you run into all over the world. Oh, there's another context for it. Now, when I was going to say a nest of wars, just so, uh, you know, the wars within wars, let me, let me give you a, a list that I use in, 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 that, in that chapter. Uh, oh, first, wait a minute, starvation. I've got to bring that out. This does get some mass media coverage, the hunger issue in Yemen. And part of that is due to, well, the, the UN, but also uh, sectarian religious groups that uh, are aware of the issue and they publish material on their uh, non-governmental organization uh, websites. There, you also, there, there's pretty, I'll say it's reliable, they go back and, and, and do the best they can to correct it if they make a mistake. You see in the World Food Program, but it's in the, in the kind of uh, deep, uh, deep weeds that uh, the groups that are uh, trying to deliver or gather, uh, 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 bring food supplies into the region for uh, movement into Yemen and, and distribution. So there's uh, there's a, a lot of logistics elements in that. So you can, and they end up talking about hunger uh, threatening um, significant proportions of uh, Yemen's 25 or 26 million people. It varies anywhere, Dan, from what it said six to seven million now because Hodeida, the port, does is uh, uh, operating. At, at one time, it was up to 17 million with a two million people. I'm doing this on memory. I want to say it was about three years ago. 17 million uh, threatened with starvation and two million people uh, you, you could classify as starving. So, and, it, and part of it is food was being used as a weapon. Now, here, here are some of the wars within wars. War for Southern secession. Now, how much, how much coverage does that give? Well, remember, Southern Yemen was at one time a different country uh, from, uh, from Yemen. And uh, in, in 1990, they, uh, they merged. But there's still a lot of Southern tribes, many of them Sunni tribes, that uh, want their own, uh, they, they want a, a, autonomy. 
if not a, a, a separate country. Uh, it, the United Arab Emirates has a lot of contacts with those, uh, those tribes, and supposedly British intelligence does as well. They will fight among themselves, and occasionally they, uh, you know, they stop and then they'll go uh, make uh, 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 war with the Houthis or the uh, other resistance. And then here's the, the big one that get, does get uh, some degree of coverage, Houthi-Shia Northern Tribal Autonomy War. That's one of the things they demand, autonomy. And there are about, you know, 9 million, 10 million people in Yemen who happen to be, uh, happen to be Shia. Figure it out. That's 40% of the population. Uh, most of them belong to the Zaidi sect that uh, the, the, the Houthis do as well. Not all of them are rebels. Then there's what I'll call the Saleh loyalist insurgency. He's former president and dictator. He was he died. He was killed in, in December 2017. But he still has a lot of what I'll call security force support, uh, supporters in Shia militias and government security forces. And they'd like to see uh, someone in his clique uh, take over the presidency in, uh, in Sanaa. And here's another one. War on Sunni militant Islamist terror organizations. This has receded at one time. It was the one that got the most press coverage in the West because Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, that we write about every so often, has its headquarters inside Yemen. And if you go back and, and, and think back to right after 9-11, uh, um, there were American drone attacks on Al-Qaeda uh, Al -Qaeda camps. Uh, and uh, Al, Al Qaeda terrorists within two years carried out uh, in in uh, in Yemen. And it's still going on. Uh, I forget the figure for twenty. Actually, I haven't seen a solid figure yet for the number of unmanned uh, attacks. On, it, was, it was at record levels last year. It's down a bit this year. Uh, all right. I, I, I read that, uh, Jim, that it was going to be down, but we're, we're, it's still in the neighborhood of 100, you know, 80 to 100. Is, is, in other words, it hasn't stopped, Dan. And one other thing, I don't have this on this list, even though I talk about it, and Jim brought it up. There's a ballistic missile war here. And the, the Iranians claim it's the Houthis shooting them at, at Saudi targets. And they say, here's their propaganda cover. Well, the, you know, Saudis are bombing us, and meaning the Houthis, so we fire back at Saudi Arabia. They're Iranian supplied missiles, and based on what you can put together, the uh, missions are overseen by Iranian technicians and Iranian uh, special operations personnel, and they fire them at Saudi air bases and Saudi cities. Patriot Pac 3s intercept all the ones that are in what are called it within parameters to try to hit a, hit a target, and the other ones just fall uh, into the desert. They're mostly short range ballistic missiles, but it's a ballistic missile war. And it's analogous in, in, in many ways to what the Iranians want to be able to do from southern Lebanon or even Syria to uh, Israel. Northern Israel be able to fire consistently short range ballistic missiles or even maybe inter, uh, intermediate range to strike, uh, to strike Israel. That's why you could say Yemen in some ways is Hezbollah land south, and meaning that Hezbollah, the Shia, Lebanese Shia militia, that's a wholly owned subsidiary of, uh, of Iran. Uh, as a matter of fact, Hezbollah operatives have shown up in Yemen. So here are the Iranians trying to work the same kind of angle against the Saudis that they worked or have worked uh, uh, against the Israelis. Now, have, have they succeeded? By no means, if anything, even though this negotiations are going on, nobody really wants to assault Hodeida or even defend it because it'd be some very ugly fighting. There's a lot of, as Jim says, this is the way they get it done in the Middle East. Who's going to pay for what? And who ultimately gains control of the port? You control that port and Aden. <clears throat> you control the ability to get food to starving people. That gives you a narrative warfare advantage. 
but you also this major port for exports of of Yemeni oil and uh, and the like. And then there's going to be a negotiation, or maybe more fighting, over who controls what uh, in the in the national government. So uh, the picture I've got here is that excuse me, this is very complicated. You've got tribal actors, you've got proxy actors, proxy warfare. As a matter of fact, uh, this the title of my uh, chapter, Proxy and Tribal Combat Amid Endemic Desperation. And uh, you're not going to be able to address from a humanitarian perspective the endemic desperation until you uh, deal with, stop <laughs> the security, <laughs> the insecurity. In other words, the uh, war, the low-level warfare is not going to disappear. There are too many, uh, they're, they're too, first of all, to be uh, fair about it, there are too many local disagreements. But the localities do have a way of working out their own issue of how we're going to get by so we don't keep killing one another. The large actor here that is causing the problem is Iran. And that's where Iran has to pay a price. It's finally started paying a price. It's paying a price domestically because their own people are tired of them, of the uh, dictatorship, wasting money on, on Yemen, getting nothing out of it. And their economy is being squeezed by uh, political and economic sanctions, mostly led by, by Washington. That's a good way to, to put some pressure on the major troublemaker in Yemen. And I'll just cut it off there, Jim. Did I miss anything? Uh, no, well, actually, there was one thing. The okay. uh, reason why Yemen is always such an issue, because they have practically no oil, very little oil at all, about 100,000 barrels a day, uh, is because until the discovery of oil, most of the people in the Arabian Peninsula lived in Yemen, because Yemen was the only part of the Arabian Peninsula that caught part of the monsoon. That's the the weather pattern that goes through the Indian Ocean, it's India, uh, he actually even hits Korea. But anyway, that annual annual heavy rains uh, also hits, you know, East Africa. It's a big deal because it basically makes a lot of those areas which are dry, normally dry, uh, habitable. And so uh, Yemen was the only part of the uh, Arabia where you could farm regularly. And, of course, one of the problems was, of course, our, when oil was discovered, the Yemen's thought it was very unfair that those sand billies, as well, they have different terms that don't really translate from Arabia, but they're not actually, they're not complimentary. Uh, they don't have sad nice things to say about the Bedouins. Um, but, you know, when the, when the Bedouins were suddenly super rich, uh, you know, uh, the, the tables were turned. Uh, it wasn't the Yemenis were never on top in terms of, you know, income and assets because they, while they could still farm, uh, there was nothing compared to the income that was flooding into the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and the other, you know, Arabian oil states. Uh, and that, that, that created a huge resentment. Now, <laughs> the, uh, the Saudis needed labor and initially they imported you know, a lot of the Yemenis, they said, hey, come on in, there's work. Uh, you know, the Bin Laden family were originally from Yemen. Uh, and they were, the, you know, the, the, the father of Osama Bin Laden uh, was a, a, a construction uh, contractor. He was very successful. The family was very successful. And uh, Osama was the, you know, the bad son, as it were. Well, they, uh, were they were from southern Yemen and they were Sunnis, too. They were, they exactly. Were yeah, they yeah. were from the tribes. Now... The, uh, the, the divisions, as Austin pointed out, there used to be two Yemens, uh, the Socialist Republic of Northern uh, you know, Yemen and the, and the tribal uh, Southern Yemen. Uh, they, it was they, socialist. The Southern called it, claimed they were socialist, too. So, you know, they're, all they're right. Well, anyway, right. the Northern one was dominated by the, uh, the Shia, which are mainly on the Saudi border. In fact, there are a number of the same types of tribes on the Saudi side, but they've never been a problem because the Saudis protected the, uh, the, the, the art of uh, buying everybody off and paying attention to tribal relationships. Uh, we, we ignore that because it works, uh, but it's basically a foundation of the, the Saudi kingdom. They spend a lot of time schmoozing you know, tribes. Uh, only, only, lo only tribes known for their, their historical loyalty to the Al-Saud family can serve in the National Guard 
that's the army that guards the, the armed forces uh, from you know attacking the the, the royal family. Uh, so this is all very medieval, but it works. Um, and but the uh, when the uh, when the 1990 uh, uh, invasion of Kuwait took place, when uh, when <laughs> when the Saddam decided, well, I owe the the Kuwaitis you know 20 billion dollars, whatever the heck it was that they loaned him when he invaded uh, 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 Iran uh, in 1979, thinking, hey, there's a civil war going on in Iran, I can grab their oil, their oil fields, and that backfired horribly. Uh, and, he, and he owed all this money to Kuwait. Uh, he decided the easiest way to deal with that debt was simply to take over Kuwait, declare it the, the, the lost 19th province of, uh, of Iraq, which was a crock. But anyway, um, uh, the Saudis... Uh, you know, basically, at, at first we're going to let it go because, well, it's not our, it's not our really dispute. And, but then somebody said, pointed out, well, you know, we're next um, because we're depending upon the Americans to defend us. Uh, the uh, the Yemenis, many of the Yemenis and the Palestinians, who are a lot of who are a large chunk of the expatriate workforce in Saudi Arabia, they backed Saddam. That did not go over well, especially when Saddam was halted and eventually pushed back. <laughs> the Yemeni workers were thrown out. And Yemen went into a, how should I put it, depression. Because those remittances, the money coming back from people working in Yemen, uh, were uh, were basically a, a large chunk of the uh, the uh, Yemeni uh, GDP, which is not unusual for a lot of countries. Uh, they now import most of their workers uh, from uh, India and Pakistan, especially India. Uh, because they find that the Indian Muslims, they prefer Muslims, but they'll take Christians or you know, Hindus even, uh, uh, you know, are basically uh, less prone to get involved with uh, Islamic um, uh, terrorism and, 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 and radicalism and what have you. Uh, but the, uh, you know, the Palestinians are, you know, that's one reason they're now uh, still very anti-Saudi. Uh, even though they depended on the Saudis for a lot of foreign aid, which has now been cut off because the Palestinians have proven themselves to be you know, very unreliable, as it were, and disorganized uh, and corrupt. Uh, uh, you know, when, you know when, you, when, you're, when you're Arab backers, you know, uh, when you're an Arab, you know, independence movement, whatever, and your Arab backers cut you off for corruption, you know you've got really real corruption problems. Uh, because a certain amount of corruption is basically taken for granted. You know, uh, there are some very, you know, non-corrupt, the, the latest Transparency International surveys for 2018 just came out. And I noted that the United, United Arab uh, Emirates has a higher score than Israel. Israel is one of the least corrupt countries in the Middle East, but it's now it's being eased out by the UAE. And, this, and the UAE has done this on purpose. They say, look, we... In the Middle East, have a problem with this, and we and we basically are, you know, when we have the oil, we're trying to uh, plan for the future because the oil won't last forever. And before we got the oil, we were basically trading states. We were the the, the ports, as it were, uh, for a very poor, you know, Arabian Peninsula. Um, and now they looked around the world. They looked at like Singapore, which has no oil, not much of not much land. They're basically like one of the, you know, the, the uh, emirates in the in the, along the coast, the, the Arab emirates of Arabia, uh, and they said, well, now they're they're similar to what have they done? Well, they've educated the population. They've they've, they've they don't impose any religious restrictions, uh, and they're very and they should have put they're very honest in their business dealings. Uh, they don't tolerate a lot of corruption, and they noticed that it worked for Israel. Uh, and a lot of other countries that don't have, again, assets like oil, uh, and they've adopted that model. They didn't, didn't make a big deal out of it. Uh, they realized, you know, well, people who do usually aren't doing it right, uh, and they are prospering because of it. Uh, uh, even the Saudis, uh, initially the Saudis were jealous. They said, oh, these damn, damn Emiratis, they've always been you know, showing us up because the, the Saudis were mainly interior, the interior tribes. Um, and, uh, but the Saudis, uh, they've been Solomon, the, the new crown prince. Uh, they said, you know, that's the future. <laughs> we may not like it in some ways, but basically, you know, what Singapore has done, what the, uh, what the Emirates have done, what Israel has done, that's the future. And that's the, that's the seismic uh, shift 
that's been going on in uh, the Middle East for the last few years, as the Arab states realize, yeah, you know, those Israelis are Semites too. Uh, you know, let's just forget about the religious differences and get together against those nasty Iranians who are, you know, the, the Aryans, you know, like Nazis. Uh, and, and they're just bad news. Um, and they're our neighbors and they want to grab our oil, which the Americans don't want to do. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, uh, people eventually, you know, catch up with what's really going on. But uh, a lot of people don't. <laughs> and that's what makes for interesting situations and tragic disasters uh, because people are basically living uh, in another reality, as it were, uh, as you have in Venezuela, where uh, they decided, well, hey, we got all this money, but there are still poor people in Venezuela. So let's start a socialist republic, the Bolivarian Socialist Republic. I mean, look at the real names they have for these places. There's a, the socialists are there's going to be free stuff for everybody. <laughs> but as the British observed, <laughs> when they went through phases like that, it only worsens until you run out of other people's money. And that can happen sooner rather than later, given <laughs> the way modern finance works. Uh, so these things always resolve themselves. Uh, again, you know, looking at the news as history, it takes some of the pizzazz out of the news. It's not as exciting. You know, you look at the way the uh, the media pitches a lot of things that are going on as if this is the latest thing. This has never happened before. But unfortunately, it's usually things that have happened again and again and again. And I know, spoiler alert, we know how it ends. Uh, but the news media doesn't like to play it that way because, you know, they want to, you know, have an exciting finale that nobody knows about. Um, so I guess you could say strategy page or spoil sports. But, hey, if you want a realistic look on what's really going on, Venezuela, the Maduro government's going to fall. But this won't end the, uh, the politics of, um, of, of Venezuela. Colombia had a similar situation, even though they got, haven't got nearly as much you know, natural resource wealth. They had this business between you know, the, uh, uh, the old you know, the colonial status, the old families, as it were, uh, which we never had, except perhaps possibly, you might say, in parts of the American South. You know, the plantation, you know, uh, uh, empires, as it were. Uh, but this is a, it is a feature of, of South, South American culture. Uh, uh, and, and basically it's created this divide between people who want to divvy up things, you know, more equitably. And those who basically want to run things efficiently, or at least for their own family benefit. Uh, and this creates a tension which never really gets resolved. Now, the Colombians, to their credit, they went a long way towards resolving a lot of these differences and ended a war that had been going on for over 50 years. Now, that didn't make too much news, uh, but it actually, it, they actually made it work. Venezuela, on the other hand, had a good thing going, and they made it worse. Uh, and you can see this all throughout South America. Argentina fluctuates between you know, getting it right and getting it wrong again. Brazil, they had a, a socialist government that turned out to be totally corrupt and ripping everybody off, and the economy was collapsing. So now you got a new, you know, uh, less socialist government in there trying to clean things up, and it's just going swinging back and forth, back and forth. This is actually an ancient problem with a participatory government. The ancient Greeks were talking about, and the in Romans, about the, you know, the, the, hatcher, the catch-22 of democracy. Yes, the people should be involved, but you've got to be careful because then the guy will come in and say, hey, I got something free, free stuff for everyone. Vote for me. All right. And I want to uh, – oh, I'm sorry. I want to make two, go, oh, okay. quick comment on that. Jim, go, go through the South American countries that you just named too, and you'll see a Caudillo effect. I mean uh, uh, Chavez definitely fed it in with that. So Juan Perón. They come in and then they, you know, they're they're <clears throat> they're really militarists, but they claim to their their militarists is what they are. But they're populists and become socialists in order to buy everyone off, and they they've got enough wealth. Uh, you know, Argentina did at the time when Perón came in, and Chavez assumed that oil prices would you know stay sky high uh, forever, and he'd be able to ride it, and it, it became a one man show. They became you know. Uh, uh, when I said Cardillos, uh, authoritarian dictators is what they were. And that is in a, <clears throat> it's not an affliction uh, just for C Central America and South America, but there are some well, political slash cultural 
uh, elements that tend to promote that. Colombia, and I go back and look at the coverage from 99 on about, about Colombia and La Valencia, Colombia finally got sick of the interior fighting, and the government also got serious. Uh, and uh, the United States, we helped out with uh, materiel and, and, and training, but it was pretty ugly. I want to say one last thing. Uh, <clears throat> Yemen's also a drug war. Jim brought up water. Yeah, that's what gave Yemen a population uh, uh, ad, uh, advantage. But now there are water sort of, uh, shortages. I know Jim knows the answer. Yeah, cot. Cot, he got it. Drug, <laughs> drug production. Somewhere between 25 and 30 percent, those are what I, I've read, and I'll, <laughs> it sounds wild, of the Yemen's water has disappeared. Well, it hasn't disappeared. They're making cot, which is a, a chewed drug that uh, I, I guess a lot, and I guess this is it's, sad. It's really. illegal in most countries in the I, Middle yeah, East. And, and it, and, 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 yeah, and the thing is, is that these poor Yemenis who are, many of them, <laughs> inadequate food, <laughs> if not no food, and this <clears throat> in, in the, endless warfare, cot usage has gone up. And uh, it's also, some of it does get smuggled out what I understand the places. Oh, a lot of it, a lot of it. The, the in, in East with, Africa. But the problem, that, you know, the problem you know. with cot is it has a very short shelf life. Yeah, right. And it, it takes a lot of water, apparently, to produce it. Oh, Guys, much, we've, much, all right, we've, hey. yeah, we've walked for 50 minutes, you know. <laughs> but there's an insight on the news, folks. Okay. It's a drug war. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, things are you never change, do they? Uh, well, we'll wrap it up for this week, and we'll talk to you guys next time. Take care. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.